Continuing from where we left off in the previous session, let us now discuss about MRI. MRI stands for magnetic magnetic resonance imaging. Has a very terms here referred to. It involves nuclear magnetic resonance. Principle of nuclear magnetic resonance which we discussed earlier and that concept is used to uh, for imaging purposes that is to find out the structure of the cells inside the human body that's imaging uh, basically a magnetic resonance imaging um, equipment consists of huge coils um, magnetic uh, coils uh, which, will provide the, which will provide the necessary magnetic field so remember when we were talking about NMR, we said that there would be a field here and then the hydrogen atoms either they have a spin up or a spin down depending on the energy levels. So this is a basic concept on which an MRI equipment works. Um, and also note that our body mainly consists of fat and water. Human body consists basically of majority of fat and water and then we have around 63% of the human body consists of hydrogen atoms so 63% of our body consists of hydrogen atoms and therefore we use hydrogen atoms as the reference for imaging purposes now basically what happens in an MRI instrument is that we have a huge coil through which when we pass current it provides the necessary magnetic field and then these hydrogen atoms are part of our body and then we send out radio frequency waves as we keep scanning or as we as we need to do the imaging we send out radio frequency radio frequency waves which will excite the hydrogen atoms inside the body specific um, uh, surrounding the specific tissues so these hydrogen atoms get excited and once they are excited when the magnetic field is disturbed when the magnetic moment is disturbed rather then these uh, hydrogen atoms in the excited state remember we said that this hydrogen atom will take on two different states energy levels depending on spin down and spin up position so when a hydrogen atom is at this level after some time they relax and then come back to this stage it's called as a relaxation time so we talk in terms of relaxation time so by observing this relaxation times by noting down the relaxation time and by knowing the radio frequency waves that we have sent or the frequency of the radio waves we have sent we can do an imaging or identify the structure of the tissues inside the human body Basically, when you send out a radio frequency wave, we are asking the question to the cell, what type of cell are you? Are you a normal cell or are you a tumor? So that is how we identify or we image the, uh, the inside of the body. So that is about nuclear mag nu magnetic resonance imaging. So magnetic resonance imaging is a technique by which we are able to map or scan the inside of the body without uh, making any cuts on the body as such. It is called non-invasive. It is non-invasive imaging. We find out the structure of the tissues inside the body and using what are known as Fourier equations. The images are obtained. So this is about the magnetic resonance imaging. Now we have covered up to this portion. Now we will look at nuclear forces, the nature of nuclear forces and then we will look at Einstein's famous equation E equal to mc square. I hope uh, up to this the concepts are very clear. So let me next take up the word. Next take up the topic of nuclear forces. So first we will look at the characteristics of the nuclear forces and then we will look at what exactly is happening and how exactly what exactly causes the 
nuclear forces as such. Let us now look at nuclear forces. To start with, let us look at the characteristics of nuclear forces. These are the general characteristics of nuclear forces. So the first point is, is they are strong attractive forces. The nuclear forces are attractive in nature and they are quite strong. How strong they are? It's about 100 times of electrostatic forces. So if a proton and proton was repulsive in nature, that would be the electrostatic force. And now thus, since the nuclear forces are very strong, although the protons are positively charged, they are held together because of nuclear forces. These forces are about 100 times stronger than that of the electrostatic forces. The next point is characteristics. They are very short range forces. Nuclear forces are very short range in nature. So for example, if um, the distance between any two particles is about 10 Fermi, then the nuclear forces become uh, minimal or almost non-existent between those two um, particles. So, so long as the particles are close together, these nuclear forces act on them. And the third point is, these nuclear forces exhibit saturate, saturation properties. What is meant by saturation properties? The nucleon interacts only with their immediate neighbors. The nucleon interacts only with their immediate neighbors. And the fourth point is, they do not obey inverse square law. That means, as you bring, for example, as you bring the particles close together, they are attractive in nature, up to an extent. And they are very strong attractive forces. But when the distance between the two particles becomes less than 0.5 for me, then the forces, the nuclear forces becomes repulsive in nature. They start repulsing one another. So this is this is what is meant by they do not obey inverse square law. When separation is greater than 0.5, they are attractive in nature, but when it is less than 0.5, the particles repel one another. And next point is this is pretty important. The nuclear forces are charge independent. As an example, the nuclear force between a proton and proton is the same as the force that is that is um, that exists between a neutron and a proton, or for that matter, a neutron and a neutron. The force between a neutron and neutron is the same as the force between a neutron and a proton, or that between a proton and a proton. So basically what we mean is the nuclear forces are charge independent. And finally we say that the nuclear force depends on the spin of the nuclei. Remember we were talking about the spin of the nuclei earlier. So here we have this uh, characteristic which says that the nuclear forces depend on the spin of the nuclei. So these are some of the general characteristics of nuclear forces. Now having looked at the characteristics of nuclear forces, now next let us look at what exactly is responsible for these nuclear forces? We have a theory suggested by a Japanese scientist um, by name Yukawa. So let us have a uh, brief look at Yukawa's theory of nuclear forces. So we will be discussing about Yukawa's theory of to explain for the nature of nuclear forces. So before that, uh, let me say that it was in the year 1936 that a Japanese scientist by name Hideki, Hideki Yukawa proposed a theory which explains the uh, it's, which explains the nuclear forces basically, uh, which accounts for the nuclear forces. According to Yukawa's theory, which has been listed out here, the protons and neutrons, as well as the neutrons, neutrons, as well as the between uh, the force between a proton and proton, is due to what is known as existence of pi mesons. And these pi mesons are of three types. One is the pi mesons can be positive, they can be neutral, or they can be negative. These pi mesons or pi mesons have a mass of about 200 times 
200 times that of an electron. So the pi mesons are around 200 times heavier than the electron and then I am sorry I think it should be around 270 so 270 times that of an electron and pi mesons can be of three types neg neutral, negative and positive they are represented by pi, pi plus, pi minus and pi zero so we call them as neutral pi meson, positive pi meson and negative pi meson So with this let us now go over Yukawa's theory to, to account for nuclear forces. So as I mentioned, this is the Yukawa's theory. The first one is it says that all nucleons, remember a nucleon stands for is a general term used for a proton as well as a neutron. So it says all nucleons consist of identical cores surrounded by oscillating cloud of pi meson. So all it says is whether I call it as a proton, if it is a proton then this would be equal to a central core surrounded by a cloud of pi meson. So if the pi meson happens to be a positive pi meson, then this becomes a proton. Whereas for a neutron, is the same as a, the core is the same even here, and a cloud that is surrounding that is of negative of neutral type pi zero meson. So if the cloud is pi zero meson or neutral meson, then we call that as a neutron. So with a core surrounded by an oscillating cloud of pi meson is what makes up a nucleon. So all nucleons consist of identical cores. Note that this core is identical, surrounded by oscillating cloud of pi meson. Mesons may be neutral, positive or negative. Now the difference between a neutron and a proton is due to the surrounding pi meson. So this is what I mentioned here. The difference between a proton and a neutron is not in terms of the core because the core is the same but in terms of the surrounding cloud of pi meson. So if the pi meson is of positive type, pi, if, the, if the pi meson is pi plus meson or a positive pi meson, then we get a proton. If it is a neutral pi meson, then we get a neutron. So that's what you mean by here, the difference between a neutron and a proton is due to the surrounding uh, meson. The next point here is important, 4 and 5, points 4 and 5 will account for the nuclear forces. So let me explain those two concepts in terms of equations here, or mathematical sense. So it says, the fourth one says, the force between a neutron and a proton is due to exchange of charged meson. So basically what happens is, a neutron if I represent a neutron with m0 then I have a neutron absorbs neutron absorbs a positive pi meson from the proton and it becomes a proton let me take out this 0 so that there is no confusion n stands for a neutron and p stands for a proton so a neutron when it acquires a positive pi meson gets transformed to a proton likewise a proton when it acquires a negative when it acquires a negative pi meson becomes a neutron so a neutron when it absorbs or acquires a positive pi meson becomes a proton. Likewise, a proton, when it gets a cloud of oscillating pi meson, negative pi meson, it becomes a neutron. So this is how a neutron can become a proton, a proton can become a neutron. And now likewise, the proton and neutron continuously exchange their nature by, by absorbing or emitting pi mesons. So this is absorption of a pi meson by neutron is absorbing a pi meson becoming a proton and a proton is absorbing a pi meson to become a neutron. Likewise, we also have likewise we also have a neutron in becoming a 
becoming a proton and then giving up a eh? giving up a eh? pi meson. Likewise, I'll have a proton turning out to be a neutron with a emission of a pi plus or a positive pi meson. So this is how the neutrons and protons continuously exchange their places. A neutron becomes a proton, proton becomes a neutron by exchange of these mesons. And now finally, we have the force between a pair of neutrons or protons are due to exchange of neutral exchange of neutral pi meson. So this is how um, the forces of the nuclear forces are accounted for. One is the force between neutron and proton is due to exchange of charged mesons as we saw in there. And finally, the force between a pair of neutrons or a pair of neutrons is because of exchange of exchange of neutral pi mesons. That is why we have three types of uh, pi mesons: a positive pi meson, a negative pi meson, and a neutral pi meson. A positive or negative pi mesons are involved when we talk in terms of forces between neutron and proton. Whereas a negative or a neutral pi meson comes into picture when we talk in terms of nuclear forces, attractive forces between two protons or two neutrons. So this is a brief description of uh, Yukawa's theory. So based on this theory and then using some advanced mathematical concepts, uh, it can be shown that the exchange of mesons lead to what are known as nuclear forces. Now the existence of these uh, mesons have been uh, experimentally uh, found out to be true. That means the pi mesons do indeed exist. So with this we have covered the topic of uh, nuclear forces and nature. Now let us move on to the next topic that is Einstein's mass-energy relationship. We are looking at this concept now. So we are now going to look at Einstein's mass-energy relationship. So having discussed about the nature of nuclear forces and the characteristics, let us now look at Einstein's mass-energy relationship. So we are going to discuss about mass-energy relation. So earlier we were thinking of mass and energy as two separate aspects. We were talking about law of conservation of mass, we were talking about law of conservation of energy. So the two were treated separately. It was Albert Einstein who showed that mass and energy are interconvertible. That means I can convert mass to an equivalent energy. Likewise, energy can be converted to an equivalent mass and therefore we have only one conservation law now is a conservation of that conservation law is applicable both for mass as well as for energy and now the Einstein's equation states that let me write down Einstein's equation here Einstein's equation is given by that is the Einstein's mass energy equation is relationship is given by the formula E equal to mc square where V where E is the energy, M is the mass of the object and C is the velocity of light. So this is the famous Einstein's equation E equal to mc square. E equal to mc square is Einstein's equation. As an example, if I have 1 kg of matter, 1 kg of matter, I can get the equivalent of this in terms of energy. So in this case, energy would be, energy in joules would be 1 kg multiplied by C is the velocity of light, which would be 3 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, this would give me as 9 into 10 to the power of 16 joule. So 
So 1 kg of matter is equal to an energy of 9 into 10 to the power of 16 joules. Yes, yeah, 9 into 10 to the power of 16 joules. So now let us look at some of the examples. It has been proved that this equation is indeed true. That is Einstein's equation has been proved to be true. Now let us look at a couple of examples when we use this concept of interconversion of mass and energy. Now the first example is about pair production. Pair production. So it has been found experimentally. It has been found experimentally. This is a nucleus. Now it has been found experimentally. Then I then gamma rays are made to impinge on the nucleus. These are gamma rays or incident on the nucleus under intense electric field then two particles are given out one is the positron and the other one is the electron so gamma rays in this case are getting converted to a positron and an electron so this is the this is a proof that a pair of particles positron and electron are getting generated or getting converted because of the gamma rays. So effectively what is happening is I can write it mathematically as H nu is the energy is getting converted to minus 1 plus E01 an electron and a positron. So energy is getting converted to matter or mass. So this is about the first example. And now the second example is a reverse of that, wherein matter is getting annihilated. So it has been found experimentally that when you bring a positron close to an electron, when you bring positron close to an electron, the two disappear and gamma rays are getting emitted. So effectively this means that plus E01 is giving me gamma rays. So this is matter radiation. The, the matter is getting converted to energy in this case. So this is the reverse of that where given energy is getting split into a matter of a positron and an electron. Likewise when I bring uh, similarly, when I bring a positron and an electron together, I get gamma rays as the uh, gen I, I can generate gamma rays out of that. The energy is released in form of gamma rays. So these are uh, two examples that illustrate Einstein's mass energy relationship. And later on, when we talk about the uh, concept of nuclear fission, fusion, etc., we'll be using this concept of Einstein's equation to find out how exactly is gen the nuclear fission for that matter is generating uh, uh, is generating energy and in fact we will be using this concept subsequently when you talk about uh, uh, other concepts such as uh, binding energy and packing defect etc. So with this we have concluded the discussion on E equal to mc square now let us uh, what the next topic there is a definition of AMU and subsequently we will take up the concept of nuclear binding etc. Now let us move over to the next topic about definition for AMU which stands for atomic mass unit. We are now looking at the definition of AMU. It stands for atomic mass unit and electron volt. We also derive an expression for the equivalence of conversion of AMU to electron volt or equivalent 
relationship between AMU and EV, electron volt. Let us start with AMU. And AMU basically stands for atomic mass units. When we use matter on earth, we use um, units such as kg. Whereas when we talk in terms of uh, atoms or in terms of nucleus, their weight is extremely small, their mass is extremely small. So we have another reference point to measure the mass of uh, mass of uh, atoms or nucleus and that unit is called as atomic mass unit. So let me define atomic mass unit. One atomic mass unit, one atomic mass unit or AMU as it is abbreviated one atomic mass unit is defined as is defined as one twelfth the mass of mass of an atom of 12C6 carbon. This is the most abundant material on earth. It has got 12 nucleons and 6 protons. So one atomic mass unit is defined as 1 twelfth the mass of an atom of C12 6. So this is a definition or agreed upon definition for the atomic mass unit. Now let us uh, derive the value for atomic mass unit in terms of kgs. So we know that from Avogadro's hypothesis, so we know that from Avogadro's hypothesis, from Avogadro's hypothesis, we know that 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 atoms of carbon weighs 12 into 10 to the power of minus 3 kg. So from our hypothesis we know that so many atoms 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 atoms of carbon weigh 12 into 10 to the power of minus 3 kg. Therefore, mass of one atom of 12C6 is given by 12 into 10 to the power of minus 3 divided by 6.023 into 10 to the power of 23 kg. By definition, we know that one atomic mass unit is defined as 1 twelfth the mass of the atom of C12. Therefore, I have 1 AMU is given by 1 twelfth mass of 1 atom mass of 1 atom of carbon which is the same as 1 twelfth this value 12 into 10 to the power of minus 3 divided by 6.023 multiplied by 10 to the power of 23 kgs. So if you simplify if you simplify this you will find that 1 AMU is equivalent to 1.66 into 10 to the power of minus 27 kg. So I find 1 AMU is 1.66 into 10 to the power of minus 27 kg. The way I started was I used Avogadro's hypothesis which says that 6.023 to 10 to the power 23 atoms of carbon weigh 12 into 10 to the power of minus 3 kg. I found out the mass of one atom and then since 1 a is 1 twelfth the mass of one atom of carbon 12, I divide this value by 12 and I get 1 a is 1.66 into 10 to the power of minus 27 kgs. So this is the derivation for the AMU. Now let us look at what is known as an electron volt. 
Let us look at the concept of electron volt and we will find the relationship between electron volt and AMU. So I hope this uh, concept of AMU is clear. Let me take up the next one that is electron volt. Basically an electron volt An electron volt is a unit of energy and one electron volt is energy gained by an electron when accelerating through a potential of one volt. So electron volt is a unit of energy. So let me write it down here. So looking at an electron volt is an unit of energy. It is equivalent to the energy gained by gained by an electron where it is accelerated through a potential difference of one volt through a potential difference of one volt. So let us use uh, the concept of work done, work done equal to charge multiplied by potential. We know that this is the equation for work done. Therefore I have one electron volt is given by charge on the electron 1.062, 1.062. 1.602 rather multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs multiplied by 1 volt which is the same as 1.602 into 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. So 1 electron volt is equivalent to 1.602 into 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. So I hope this concept is clear now. Now let us find out the relationship between an AMU and electron volt. So basically what we will be doing is we are going to use Einstein's mass energy uh, relationship because we have mass that is 1 AMU is equal to so and so and then we have 1 electron volt that is energy. So we will we'll find out the equivalent of mass energy uh, for an AMU. So let us now look at relationship between relationship between AMU and electron volt. So what we are going to do initially is we are going to start off with the equation E equal to mc square. So let m be 1 AMU is equal to y 1 AMU in this case. Therefore, energy is given by 1 AMU multiplied by C square is 3 into 10 to the power of 8 whole square which will be and now I know 1 AMU is equivalent to 1.66 into 10 to the power of minus 27 and then I have this as C square as 9 into 10 to the power of 16 which will give me an equivalent of one point six six multiply by let me I think this is equal to 1.66 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 27 into 9 into 10 to the power of 16. So therefore I have energy is given by 
1.66 into 10 to the power of minus 27 multiplied by 9 into 10 to the power of 16 joule. I also know that 1 electron volt, also just now I derived that 1 electron volt is equivalent to 1.602 into 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. So when I combine equations, this equation with this, I can get the energy in terms of electron volt. So it's therefore I have E is given by 1.66 into 9 into 10 to the power of minus 11 divided by so from this I am getting 1.66 into 9 to 10 to the power of minus 11 divided by 1.602 into 10 to the power of minus 19 electron volt is equal to 931 into 10 to the power of 6 electron volt is the same as 931 million electron volt. Therefore, I say 1 AMU is equal to 931 MeV. One atomic mass unit is equal to 931 million electron volt. So, all I did was I just started off with the expression E equal to mc square. This is Einstein's equation giving the relationship between energy and mass. So I took, I assumed the mass to be one atomic mass unit because I want to find out the energy equivalent to one atomic mass unit. So when I substitute that, I get 1.66 into 10 to the power minus 27 multiplied by c square, that is 9 into 10 to the power 16 joules. Why? I want to convert this to electron volt. So I know the equation, one electron volt is equal to 1.602 into 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. And therefore I have energy E given by for one electronic, uh, for one AMU, the energy is 931 million electron volt. Therefore, I get the expression one AMU is equal to 931 million electron volt. This is a standard equation that is used to convert AMU to MEV. So, you'll have to remember this uh, expression pretty well. So, with this, we have covered the topic of definition of AMU or uh, e, uh, electron volt and also derived the expression for relationship between AMU and electron volt. The next topic we will be taking up is nuclear binding energy. What is meant by binding energy? And um, things like that. So we will take up the topic now of uh, nuclear binding energy. Let us now look at the topic of nuclear binding energy. So we will discuss what is known as nuclear binding energy. As we can guess, the nuclear binding energy represents the energy that binds the nucleons within the nucleus. So basically let us uh, start out with uh, the concept of mass of the nucleus so let us say this is the nucleus um, the nucleus has got a mass mn let us assume mn is the mass of the nucleus and then the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons as we mentioned earlier so if you take the sum total of the masses of the protons and the mass of the neutron that mass the total mass is found to be less than the uh, rather it has been found to be more than the mass of the nucleus basically what happens is the sum total of the individual neutrons and protons put together is always greater than the mass of the nucleus so that difference in mass is what is coming out as a binding energy. So as per Einstein's um, uh, mass uh, energy relationship with E equal to mc square, 
when a nucleus is formed, part of the mass is lost, and that uh, energy different that difference in mass is what manifested in the form of binding energy. So a binding energy is an energy with which the nucleons are held together within the nucleus and it is measured, the binding energy is measured in terms of the work that is needed to be done to pull the nucleons apart from the nucleus, out of the nucleus. So let us derive a simple equation for the binding energy. So let us say the, we also introduce some more concepts called mass defect. So I will explain that as we go through this derivation. Now let let us say A is the atomic number of the nucleus. Let us say is the mass number. As we discussed earlier, the mass number gives the total number of nucleons. Or rather, I am sorry. I, I wrote it the reverse way. So this is let A be the <coughs> mass number. and be the atomic number. So basically this stands for total number of nucleons. Total number of nucleons. Nucleon is a word that is used to represent both proton as well as a neutron. And then atomic number represents the total number of protons in the nucleus. So, also let us assume that Ma, let us say Mp stands for mass of proton, mass of one proton, let us say Mn stands for mass of one neutron and let us now assume that Mn is the mass of the nucleus. Mn is the mass of the nucleus, Mp is the mass of proton, Mn is mass of neutron. So therefore from this we find that total mass of protons plus neutrons inside the nucleus should be equivalent to Mp is the number of mass per proton multiplied by number of protons should be and then I must have A is atomic mass number number of neutrons should be A minus Z into M N so this should be the total mass of protons plus neutrons assuming they were free but the mass of the nucleus is given as Mn and now we find that we find that Mn is always less than it has been found that the mass of the nucleus is always less than the sum total of the mass of protons and neutrons and that is the reason we get binding energy. Now what happens is if I see the difference in delta, so delta m, the mass that has disappeared, the mass that has apparently disappeared when the nucleus gets formed is given by plus a minus z or z mn minus m capital N. So this is the mass that has disappeared when the nucleus gets formed. Now from Einstein's equation we have, we have, from Einstein's equation we have M E equal to M C square. So in this case I want to find the equivalent of the equivalent energy for this delta M, the mass that has disappeared on the nucleus getting formed and therefore we have 
E in this case is given by E is given by mc square. I substitute this value for m. So I get this as mp plus a minus v mn minus m capital N. Uh, I need to have this minus mn into c square. So this is the equation I get for binding energy. This is the binding energy equation. So let me uh, quickly recapitulate what we what we mentioned just now. We said that if I take the sum total of the protons and the neutrons together and compare that with the mass of the nucleus then it is always found that the mass of the nucleus is less than the sum total of the masses of the individual nucleons. The energy that disappears on formation of a nucleus is known as the binding energy. The energy goes in holding the nucleons together within the nucleus. Work has to be done to move the nucleons from, from the uh, from the nucleus and that is called as a nuclear binding energy. So the energy that is holding the nucleus, the nucleons together within the nucleus is the binding energy of the nucleus. Now here is a derivation of the binding energy. So we started out telling that A is the mass number of the nucleon, uh, of the A is the mass number and incidentally A also represents the total number of nucleons. And now Z is the atom atomic number which also represents the number of protons. We assume that Np is the mass of proton, Mn is the mass of neutron and N capital N is the mass of the nucleus. Now the mass of protons plus neutrons taken individually is Znp plus A minus Z into Mn. It is because I am looking at only the number of neutrons. So A is the atomic mass, is A is the mass number and then z is the atomic number so a minus z gives the number of neutrons and now we find that mn is always less than or equal to the individual sum masses of the nucleons i take the difference and delta m is is given by this expression one that means this much of mass has disappeared when the nucleus got formed and now this mass is to get manifested in form of energy and we have from Einstein's equation E equal to mc square. So here I am trying to find out the equivalent energy for this mass that has disappeared on formation of the nucleus. And therefore from this equation I, um, when, I, when I compute E, I find that E is equal to Znp plus A minus Z into Mn minus M capital N into C square. This is the binding energy of the nucleus. So this expression gives the binding energy of the nucleus. Now let us move on to the next uh, definition which is specific binding energy. So specific binding energy or is also called as binding energy per nucleon or binding energy per nucleon. So as you can guess it is uh, pretty straightforward. This expression gives the total binding energy of the nucleus. When I divide this by the number of nucleons, I get the specific binding energy or the binding energy per nucleon. And therefore, I have specific binding energy is defined as specific binding energy is defined as total binding energy or the binding energy as such. Binding energy of the nucleus divided by number of mass number that is number of nucleons this is Be divided by A we can represent that as Be divided by A so we have discussed about uh, binding energy and we also discussed about specific binding energy or binding energy per nucleon now let us look at what is known as binding energy curve we are going to look at binding energy curve. So let me erase this portion and then draw the diagram for the binding energy curve. 
So it still requires this specific bind expression for the specific binding energy. Let us now look at the graph of new, of binding energy or specific binding energy against the mass number. So this is a plot that I get when I draw the bind the specific binding energy that is binding energy per nucleon on the y axis and mass number on the x axis. Note that this figure, this graph that I get has got some sharp peaks here and then it has got these are the observations we have here basically. So the average binding energy for light nuclei, this average binding energy for light nuclei such as hydrogen is very small. So here you can see that. On the y axis I have the binding, specific binding energy in million electron volt. We find that there are peaks here and these peaks correspond to helium, carbon and oxygen. Which means that these elements or these nucleus are quite stable. Now the third observation I have is the binding energy or the specific binding energy has a broad maximum between A is equal to 30 somewhere around here to somewhere around here around 120 this is the maximum binding energy more, more is the binding energy more stable is the nucleus so maximum binding energy of 8.8 .8 million electron volt corresponds to iron at 56 somewhere here so this is the most stable nucleus we have because it has the maximum specific binding energy and now for higher binding for higher mass number I find that the binding energy decreases that means these elements are less or less stable for example elements beyond U238 have less binding energy and therefore they are likely to be broken up apart so they are unstable in nature now let us look at the significance of this uh, uh, diagram. There is a specific binding energy versus mass number diagram. First important thing you need to observe here is since these elements, elements particularly here, have got smaller binding energy, it also implies, gives a clue that I can combine two or more of these nuclei to form a stable nuclei. That means I can use the concept of nuclear fusion. I can fuse two or more nuclei to get a stable nuclei in which case the mass number would go up therefore for since these elements this nucleus have got smaller binding energy I, they are unstable and by fusing or combining two nucleus I can make the nucleus much more stable likewise when I look at the other extreme end it also says that these uh, nucleus that have higher mass numbers are quite unstable and I can make them stable by breaking them up into two or two element, two uh, other nucleus, in which case they would get pushed somewhere here. And since these have a higher binding energy, the elements or the or the nucleus that are got as part of the uh, fusion would fission would be much more stable. So this is right. We are talking about hydrogen. I was referring to fusion. I am bringing two nucleus together and fusing them into one so that is fusion when I talk about uh, breaking up a nucleus here that is called fission and breaking them apart so elements at high with higher mass mass number can undergo nuclear fission and give out stable nucleus like and the other way is elements which have or nucleus that have smaller mass number can get fused together to form stable nucleus or stable nuclei. So this is the importance of this diagram of specific binding energy against mass number. Now after having discussed about uh, nuclear binding energy in some detail, now let us look at the last topic in this nuclear binding energy discussion that is packing fractions. The concept of packing fraction and subsequently we will take up what is known as nuclear fusion, fusion and stellar energy. So let us now discuss about uh, packing fraction in some detail. Let us now look at the concept of packing fraction. Packing fraction is defined as the mass defect to mass number of the isotope. So for example if we take M to represent the mass of the isotope 
and then A as the mass number, then the packing fraction is given by mass of the isotope minus mass number divided by mass number. M minus A divided by A is given as the packing fraction. Now let us um, note some important um, aspects here. One is since atomic masses are measured relative to C12 isotope, the packing fraction for C12 isotope as such is zero. Next, the packing fraction is a measure of the stability of the atom. Packing fraction gives an indication of how stable the nucleus is. Now let us draw a diagram of packing fraction this side represents packing fraction and on the x-axis let me rewrite this so on this side I have the packing fraction So on the y on the y axis I have packing fraction, on the x axis I have the mass number. A plot of packing packing fraction versus mass number yields a curve of this type. A couple of observations that we need to make here, that is for elements which have mass number less than 20 have packing fraction that is greater than 0. So we have positive packing fraction for atoms for elements that have mass number less than 20. Likewise, for elements that have mass number greater than 200, the packing fraction is positive. And for all elements that are between 20 to 200, the packing fraction is negative. So a negative packing fraction indicates that these, that these elements are quite stable or nuclear is, the, the nucleus are quite stable. So negative packing fraction indicates stability of the nucleus and anything which is, has a positive indicates some kind of instability. Note that elements such as uh, helium-4-12-16, helium, uh, oxygen, the nitrogen do not fall in this uh, graph. So this is about the explanation of packing fraction, definition of packing fraction and the graph of packing fraction versus mass number. Note that again that these elements that have mass numbers between 20 and 200 since they have a negative packing fraction those elements are quite stable. So with this we conclude the discussion on uh, nuclear binding energy. Now let us take up the topic of nuclear fission next. We'll continue this session uh, in the next hour. Thank you.